Welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Petra Larsen, and I'm a PhD candidate here at Manchester International Law Centre. And um, before we proceed to the introduction of our very distinguished Melan Shill uh, keynote speaker, uh, I just want to say a few words about the Melan Shill lecture series uh, that was relaunched by John Dasprimont and Ian Scobie when they created the Manchester International Law Centre in 2014. And first, all thoughts go to Ms. Olive Shield, who made this uh, series possible by virtue of a generous bequest to Manchester University. This to prevent international conflict and to honour the memory of her brother Edward Mellonshield, who died in World War I. And it was Professor Ben Wortley who organised the historic uh, lecture series that was delivered between 1961 and 1974. And his successor, Gillian White, instead decided to replace it with a monograph series. And uh, Christine Chinkin and Hilary Charlesworth, who were with us yesterday, they have both contributed to this monograph series. Um, and their works will soon be republished with new introductions. Please note that uh, Robin Jennings' Acquisition in Territories and International Law was also republished last year with a new introduction by Marcella Cohen. Uh, the old lecture series otherwise saw such prominent names as Quincy Wright, Dan O'Connell, and Sir Ian Sinclair. And with the relaunch, the annual Melanchthon Lecture has further been delivered by Professor John Duguid, uh, Her Excellency Judge Hankin Shui, and Sir Michael Wood. <coughs> we are pleased to let you know that all these famous lectures have now been digitised and are available online via Manchester Library. So it is against the background of this proud tradition that we are immensely honoured to have uh, Professor Young Klabbers uh, deliver the 2018 Annual Melanchthon Lecture. Professor Surya Sabedi has kindly accepted to introduce uh, this lecture and also to moderate the later discussion. But first, it's my role to briefly introduce uh, Sabedi. Professor Sabedi is a Professor of International Law at the University of Leeds. To mention a few of his many achievements, it was a long list, uh, Professor Sabedi was in 2017 appointed as Honorary Queen's Counsel in recognition of his contribution to the development of international law. He was also the first international law lawyer to be appointed at QC Honoris Causa that previously had a domestic scope. And last but not least, he was in 2014 nominated for UN High Commissioner for Human Rights after serving six years as the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Cambodia during which time he was also an advisor to the British Foreign Secretary. So many thanks, Professor Surya Sabedi. It's my pleasure to leave you the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. I would like to begin by thanking Petra for her kind words of introduction. I also would like to take the opportunity to thank both John and Ian for asking me to come and chair this session. I gladly accepted the invitation for two reasons. First of all, they brought the ESIL conference to this part of England, Northern England. And out of solidarity, coming from a neighboring university, Leeds, not very far from here, I would like to thank you for bringing the conference here and asking me to chair the session. I gladly accepted the invitation. Also, because the theme of the conference is a fascinating one for me, universalism in international law. That's the topic that has been dear to me for a long time. And I have attended many of the sessions and benefited a lot, a rich, insightful discussion that have taken place. And I would like to thank you, all of you, uh, for being here. But my main job is to introduce the speaker of this lecture, and then moderate the Q&A session after the lecture. <coughs> I have the honor and privilege to introduce Professor Ian Klabers, who I have known for a long time. I regard him as a friend and a colleague, a distinguished colleague, as our keynote speaker. A person of his name and fame perhaps does not need an introduction to an audience of this kind, but I would like to do my job properly and introduce him to you by way of honoring his outstanding contribution to international law. This is an occasion where we honor and celebrate and acknowledge the contribution made by 
the person delivering the lecture. Therefore, my honor is to introduce properly, highlighting some of his achievements. The list of achievements is longer than mine, Petra, but I'll be very brief. We don't have time. Yan has been a leading light in the world of international law for so many decades. He's currently professor of international law at the University of Helsinki, where he has been teaching since 1996. Prior to that, he taught at the University of Amsterdam, where he also conducted his undergraduate and postgraduate studies. He has led large research projects on global governance and the role of virtue of ethics in international affairs, and has held visiting appointments at, amongst others, NYU Law School, the Graduate Institute of International Law and Development Studies, and Sorbonne. He is a co-author of the Constitutionalization of International Law, published in 2009, and his main publications include the concept of treaty in international law in 1996, treaty conflicts and European Union in 2008, an introduction to international organization law in 2015. I was very happy to write an endorsement for that publication. I read it with much interest and benefited a great deal. And of course, international law in 2017, second edition came out in 2017. A volume on the challenges of interlegality co-edited with Gian Luigi, Palmo Bella, is in press. So this is a very briefly an account of the contribution that Professor Clavers has made. And it is my honor to ask you to take the floor and deliver the lecture tonight. And the title of the lecture is, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, the title of the, sorry. The title of the lecture is On Epistemic Universalism and the Melancholy of International Law. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker tonight. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for those kind words, Surya. Um, and thank you, Jean, Ian, for asking me to do this and placing me in the rather prestigious line of people you see here behind me the Mellon Schill series. It's quite humbling to do that. Um, I have a confession to make. As a young boy, I wanted to become a football player. <laughs> so the thought of playing at Old Trafford was quite enchanting. Obviously, I may not have been talented enough, or maybe my talent has been overlooked. Who knows? <laughs> but the football career is not happening anymore. Instead, we'll be having dinner at Old Trafford, and you can imagine that that's a pretty damn good reason to sing for my supper. <laughs> okay, I wasn't here yesterday, sadly. I had another commitment that I couldn't escape from, but my spies in the audience told me that Jean opened by saying this is a conference about contesting universality narratives. The up uh, the long and the short, the upshot being that every universality narrative has to be contested. That might be a bit overstretching things, but at least it guarantees high drama. Um, I will take issue with Jean's position on this, and you'll figure out by the end how that will take place. Um, when we talk about universality in international law, we usually, or traditionally perhaps, used to think of the idea that international law should have rules that bind the entire globe, each and every one <laughs> concerned. That was always a bit overblown, right? We have the persistent objector doctrine telling us that people can escape from some rules. We have this idea of sovereignty and consent, that you can't be bound by rules that you don't really like. But nonetheless, there is a pull towards the universal. Think only of our habit to call every international organization with more than 100 member states a universal international organization. Somehow, the topic of whether international law rules span the globe seems to be important, but not particularly interesting anymore. A second conception 
of universality or universalism is to hold or to refer to the coverage of international law in terms of fields of human activity. Thus, one could wonder, is labor law part of international law? Is tax law in its international dimensions part of international law? There's thousands of double taxation treaties, and yet most of us in the audience won't have a clue what arm's length pricing refers to, right? I don't, at any rate. Asylum law, health law, perhaps. There are a bunch of issues where we're sort of struggling to see whether they fit into the scope, the universal scope, or would be universal scope of international law. Now, if our traditional idea about the reach of rules was considered important but not terribly interesting, this is considered interesting but perhaps not terribly important. A third approach, a third conception of universality one can think of is the one that I think was foremost in the minds of the people who drafted the program here, is the inclusiveness of the international legal order. Whether the global south is represented, whether women are represented, whether minorities are represented. And that's considered both important and interesting. I have a fourth conception that I would like to explore with you, and that is whether the ways we communicate with each other has something universal in it. Is there something like epistemic, or if you want, methodological universalism in international law? And thus far, that seems to have been considered neither important nor interesting. So I thought it would make for a good keynote. <laughs> right? OK, traditionally, it's always risky to start with that word, but uh, bear with me. Traditionally, I guess it's fair to say that international law was usually conceived of as a law of states. And the underlying question, both for practitioners and academics, was to find out what international law is. What are its rules? How should we understand them? How should we interpret them? How can we identify international law? And if we can identify, what exactly does it say? I think that was for most 19th and for a long time into the 20th century, sort of the standard paradigm by which international lawyers operated, whether they were practitioners or academics. And needless to say, the boundary line between those two was fairly thin, with people moving back and forth on occasion. And the purpose of that was not, someone mentioned this already earlier today, the purpose of this was not so much to create heaven on earth, but to have hell, to prevent hell from descending. The purpose of the exercise, the purpose of international law, was perhaps more as a rear guard defense than as a project of achieving universal nirvana. And there was fairly little room in all this pragmatism for conceptions of justice, for better or worse. This would explain why people in the 1920s and 1930s put a lot of attention to drafting the Harvard drafts on the law of treaties, for instance, one of my pet projects. That's why the Americans are still working on restatements of the law. That is why the Institut de Droit International and the International Law Association end up spending a lot of energy in drafting resolutions, some of them replacing more formal codification exercises. That's why the International Law Commission was set up, to figure out what the law is and what its rules say. And, and to sprinkle that a little bit with progressive development, but that core task seemed to have been fairly clear. And individuals too, individual scholars would work in that tradition. One example that comes to mind most closely is that of Lord McNair's Law of Treaties first published in the 1930s as the go-to source on the law of treaties, reissued or redone in 1961 and reissued in the 1990s. It somehow still seems to speak to the discipline. But for McNair, you can also read Schermer's, his work on international organizations law, or the other classic treatises of earlier years. <clears throat> 
That does not say, that does not mean that there were no methodological debates, because there were. There were debates on how best to find out what the law is, how best to find out what the law says. Georg Schwarzenberger, whose name was mentioned today, would be critical of many of his colleagues saying they engage in deductive wishful thinking. One should have an inductive approach instead. Look at what courts actually decide. Look at what states actually do. Myers McDougall, there he is, Peter Jan, you were waiting for him earlier. Myers McDougall and his associates would have a different approach, the New Haven approach, vaguely sociological in orientation, developed with Harold Laswell, and most of it rather unreadable. <laughs> you would have Max Huber writing in 1910 on the sociological foundations of international law, or Charles de Vicher writing half a century later on theory and reality, both proposing a sociological jurisprudence. But nonetheless, McDougall, Schwarzenberger, Huber, de Vichere, and all those other guys, which were usually guys, stayed within the same paradigm by and large. Their brief, however exactly they looked at it, was most of all to figure out what the law is and what it says, where to find the law, and then figure out what exactly it does. They stayed within that same paradigm, and they talked to each other. Those of you who've looked a bit at interpretation of treaties will be familiar, sorry, will be familiar with the great debate between McDougall and Fitzmaurice. McDougall being part of the US delegation to the Vienna Conference on the Law of Treaties, which is an indication, of course, that he was not considered as much of an outlier as we might now think of him. McDougall's associates ran into high positions, taught at the Hague Academy, uh, Michael Reisman, uh, Rosalind Higgins. Michael Reisman is sitting on pretty much every investment tribunal you can think of. <laughs> Rosalind Higgins made it to president of the International Court of Justice. Florentino Feliciano sat on the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. So even if their approach would have been different, they'd still be part of that same paradigm. I think that this paradigm has deserted us a little, or maybe we have deserted it a little. And perhaps telling is that in 1984, my compatriot Martin Boss would still write a book on a methodology of international law, that was its title, which reads as a handbook for people to figure out where to find the law. Half of it is on how to recognize custom. The other half is on interpretation of treaties and interpretation of judgments. The methodology, in other words, that Boss spoke of was the one associated with that classic paradigm, with trying to figure out what the law is and what exactly it says. If you look at works on methodology published these days, I think of Olivier Cortin, I've seen him today, in Methodologie de droit international public, which is mostly geared towards academic research in international law. The audience is no longer solely the practitioner slash academic, because that used to overlap. Now there seems to be a distinction. The methodologie that Cortin writes, Cortin writes, is mostly for the academic. And if you look at Anne Orford's wonderful piece a couple of years ago in the London Review on international legal method, you'll notice that every pretense of talking to practitioners has completely disappeared. That is a methodology for academics, period, full stop. Now, that leads to a preliminary conclusion, perhaps. And here, maybe I should take a little sip. I need both hands, because otherwise you'll notice I'm shaking. <laughs> Hey, come on, it's not every day you get to speak to an audience like this. <laughs> um, preliminary conclusion, international law is no longer about what states do. International law has become about what international lawyers do. And that's an interesting point. We have been worried until a decade ago, or maybe still, about the fragmentation of international law. But perhaps 
we should be more concerned with the fragmentation of international lawyers into different groups that have a hard time talking to each other. I think by and large, roughly, with big margins, we can identify three of those groups. There is the traditional doctrinal approach to international law. That's in one corner. There is, since the 1980s, a critical approach to international law. That's in another corner. And there is, maybe also since the 80s, maybe a little bit more recent in international law, a third group, the rationalist group, the law and economics people and related rational choice type of approaches, which is yet a third corner. Now, how has that come about? My claim is that, to some extent, this results from our professional ecology. That's a wonderful phrase, by which I mean to say that what we are doing as academics, and I can only speak for academics, I guess, if I can speak for anyone at all, um, but I've never held an honest job in my life, as they say, <laughs> so that's all I know. Um, the professional ecology, the way our work environment is structured these days, I think does two things. It incentivizes competition between scholars. I see some people nodding already, like, yeah, I remember, I recognize that. And this is where my comment on Jean comes in, at least very briefly for the moment. It incentivizes high drama. Now, let me explain what I mean with those two points. Perhaps the first point to make, a preliminary point, is that it's surprising that few people have looked at how our working environment ends up stimulating or influencing the way we work. We do that all the time with states. We're perfectly willing to say that states are constrained by having to participate in a market economy globally, and thus they choose route A rather than route B. But when it comes to our own work, we're hesitant to go there, perhaps because it seems to suggest that we're not as autonomous as we would like ourselves to be. Let me leave that floating for a while, and you can get back to that over dinner or something. <laughs> That's the point of a keynote, right? To give people something to talk about. So here we go. Now, as I said, my claim is that our professional environment, our professional ecology, incentivizes competition and incentivizes high drama. Let's start with that competition. In a way, that seems weird to complain about our research environment, because from one perspective, there's far more research funding available than there ever was. There are far more journals in which we can publish our results than there ever were. Those journals are widely available. Some of them are open access, some are not. But even so, they're widely available with internet and all that. Like when I did my PhD, on a side note, if I wanted something from the Wisconsin International Law Journal, I had to take a train from Amsterdam to The Hague, to the Peace Palace, ask for the copy, and if I was lucky, it would be on my desk an hour later. If I was unlucky, someone else had it, and I had to get back home. Nowadays, there's internet libraries, and you just, you know, you print them, you have them within half a minute. That's a sideshow. So more journals, more publication venues, more funding for research, a lot easier available, all that, and many more postdoc positions than even 10 years ago. So things are looking well, right? Well, there are, of course, opportunity costs. Research funding tends to be re-channeled from what used to be core funding of universities. And now we are made to compete for it, which means we have to publish a lot. And that means we publish on things that are easy to publish about. We do, yeah, you're laughing, but I guess that's a sign of recognition, right? <laughs> We publish about the sort of things that we can do in the comfort of our study without having to go to archives too much, without having to do an awful lot of legwork. It's far easier to write about things that are in the public domain and electronically available than it is to figure out things that are not so clearly available. 
And the temptation, of course, if we want to boost our publication lists, and I'm as guilty of that as anyone else, is to take the easy way out, to jump where the fence is the lowest. Which helps explain, no doubt, why, this is my own field of international organizations, why I can, from the top of my head, think of dozens of studies on the World Bank, or the WTO, or the UN, but I cannot think of a single monograph on the International Organization for Migration, other than the one that was published by the IOM itself to mark its 50th anniversary a decade ago. I can think of studies on the World Bank, but not on the International Olive Council, what it is, what it does. The last study to have appeared on the International Aviation Organization, Civil Aviation Organization was published in 1969. Good morning. The last study on revision of international organization charters was published in 1968. The last book length study, there have been a couple of very good articles since, but the last book length study on financing goes back to the early 1960s, financing of international organization. So there are clearly gaps, and we are happy to leave them because other stuff is so much easier to do. And I think. That is not because we're lazy buggers by definition, although speaking for myself, that's part of it, but partly also because the structure of our professional environment stimulates quantity over asking questions like, do we actually need this kind of information? So we are told to publish a lot, no matter what, and we are told to sell our work properly. We are told to look at the impact of the work, to measure the impact and publish in journals which have more impact than other journals, regardless of readership, regardless of quality. We are told to tweet our research results. How on, yeah, Peter Jan, thank you. <laughs> How on earth does one tweet the contents of a 300 page wrought out monograph in 140 words, or characters even? One doesn't. It's just ridiculous. But we are told to be interdisciplinary. But if we're too interdisciplinary, if we develop our own methodology to tackle a different set of problems in a different way, we won't get funding because the people reviewing our applications won't recognize the methodology. They will say, no, 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 this can't work. This is not what we do. <laughs> it's hopeless. Tenure has been abolished. Organizations, institutions, universities, law schools, faculties, departments aim to control their staff. So tenure is abolished. I was asked kindly by my law school some time ago, but in an undertone like, if you don't, you'll know where you are, <laughs> to apply for an uh, individual researcher identification number, an ORCID number. See? <laughs> It starts to hit home. The reason for that is not because that would make my research better, right? The reason for that is that there's another young clubbers who is a sociologist, last seen working at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands, who's now retired. Um, and there is a fear that my publications will be listed by someone who doesn't pay attention under those of him. So they would merit the University of Nijmegen rather than the University of Helsinki. We can't have that, right? And also vice versa. And vice versa, yeah, but since he is retired, he's <laughs> right and <in> less. <laughs> so you see the problem, right? <laughs> so no more tenure. Support staff has been moved upstairs or kicked out. We have people who can tell me how to enhance the impact of my writings, basically telling me to get it tweeted and retweeted. But I have a problem if the printer breaks down. There is no one I know who to call anymore, who to fix the printer. So that would enhance my impact perhaps more than the odd tweet, but never mind. The point is that we have entered, we have allowed ourselves to become embroiled in a system of global competition. The way our profession, the way academic work is organized these days, stimulates competition between scholars rather than collaboration, cooperation, 
Of course, lip service is being paid to that, but at the end of the day, it is about competition. As the saying goes, in politics, it's dog eat dog. In academia, it's the other way around. So, <laughs> now, that's one thing our professional ecology does. It suggests that we should be competitive. The other thing is that it incentivizes high drama because we can only sell our work, it will only have impact, it will only be tweeted and retweeted if we can give it a substantive label, if we can say this is where the action is, this is what happens. We're not just talking about an analysis of Article XYZ of the ICC statute, no, we're bringing an end to the culture of impunity. We're not just talking about freedom of labor or something. No, we're guaranteeing human dignity. We're not just promising you a half-decent book on topic X, Y, or Z if you give us money. No, we promise you a paradigm shift. <laughs> Have you ever reviewed research proposals for funding agencies? Count the times you see the word paradigm shift. If you get a dollar for every paradigm shift you're supposed to identify, you'd be rich in no time. And that in a discipline which doesn't have paradigms all that much. <laughs> it's uh, Thomas Kuhn, the guy who invented the paradigm, can I say that? Wrote his book, The Structure of, uh, of Scientific Revolutions in the early 60s. He said there are some paradigms in the natural sciences, but it's very unlikely that there are any real paradigms in the social sciences and or humanities. And I think he was right about that if you adopt the notion of paradigm in a properly narrow way. But paradigm shifts we are. Now the problem with all those things, with the paradigm shifts, with bringing an end to the culture of impunity, is that we can only aspire to those as byproducts of the sort of thing that we can actually deliver. We can promise the moon, but we can't deliver. At best, if we develop rockets, we can send someone to the moon at some point. I'm not the first one to make that observation. The Norwegian philosopher John Elster makes the point very nicely in his book Sour Grapes, which is almost 40 years old, that you cannot wish yourself to sleep. You cannot order yourself to be spontaneous. By the same token, we cannot order heaven to come to earth. All we can do is tinker in the margins. All we can do is what Tom Frank used to speak of, as muddling through, and then hope that maybe at the end of the day there is some kind of side effect there. To make it worse, we tend to take moral holidays. We write our piece on Article X, Y, or Z of the Rome Statute, and then our work is done. Yeah, then we can all move on to the next piece without necessarily thinking that maybe someone should do something with our insights. The moral holiday, as soon as the treaty is concluded, the piece is written, the resolution is adopted. So, those three approaches that I identified earlier, the doctrinal approach, the critical approach, the rationalist approach, they tend to sit in their own fortresses, and I think that's partly caused by our professional ecology. They sit in their own little fortresses and have a hard time coming out. Think of the Hague Academy of International Law, which is a wonderful bastion of doctrinal scholarship in the very best possible manner. But it's very difficult to imagine David Kennedy being there. It's very difficult to imagine Eric Posner being invited at the Hague Academy. There are people who manage to bridge the fortresses, but quite a few are kept out of the Hague Academy. And now the Hague Academy is just an example because David Kennedy's international, uh, what is it, the, the IGLP thing, the Global Law Program, does exactly the same. You won't find Eric Posner there either. You won't find many doctrinal people there either. So everyone in their own little corner. Um, not much talking going on, but fierce competition for funding, for positions, for the possibility of doing one's academic work. Now, there is, if you will, 
a sense of epistemic injustice there, neglecting other people's work because of its origins. It's about as bad as neglecting other people's work because you don't like the way they speak English or because you don't like the way they dress. Apologies. Because you don't like their haircuts, necessarily. We should perhaps start to talk to each other a bit more. Now, in terms of universalism, one might say that there is one universalism that has prevailed in our discipline, and that's the universalism of competition. I think that's one, and here I side with John, that's one universalism that should be rejected. But importantly, perhaps, it should be rejected not because it's universal, but because it is hopelessly irreconcilable with any kind of academic ethos. Thank you. Well, thank you, and congratulations. It was a fascinating, rich, and insightful lecture. You talked about the past, present, and future trends in international law academy, uh, the real life situation uh, of we <coughs> academics working in the field of international law. You touched on what do we mean by universalism? going beyond the geographical scope of rules and principles. I think what we are trying to achieve as international lawyers is universality and unity in diversity. The debate has been going on for some time. You touched on the different perspectives of different groupings of states, the global south and the global north developing countries and developed countries. But in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, the distinction between developed and developing countries is becoming increasingly redundant. States are now aligning themselves on the basis of their national interest. G20, G77, or even BRICS. Do they represent the entirety of the global south? No. I call them the aristocracy of the global south. Do the aristocracy of the global south represent the real values of the global south? Global south has its own diversity. So does the global north. In terms of application or interpretation of international law. Um, you are right in saying that traditionally international lawyers much of it, until about a few decades ago, were devoting their attention to explaining what the law is. But fortunately, your generation, my generation, has moved on. We are now also questioning whether international law is fair in the first place. Fairness and justice, to what extent international law addresses these issues. So the debate has moved on. There I can see universality in the making. Scholars around the globe are going beyond explaining what the law is, but ex examining the object and purpose and fairness and justice within international law. In my view, universalism is not imposed on us international lawyers. Yes, the international law that we have studied today has Eurocentric origins in it, but it depends on how far back in history you go to understand the origins of international law. How many of us know and appreciate what the father of international law, Hugo Grossus, saw when he visited the Far East as an officer working for the Dutch East India Company? What about the practice of the distant past? Many people have analyzed the colonial legacy of international law. What about the history before the colonization period? In human history, the period of colonization was rather short. 
Of course, that heart has a big impact on all of our lives, especially the people in the global south. But in terms of human history, very short period of time. International law in some form, rudimentary, it didn't have the name international law, existed prior to colonization period, existed prior to the time of Hugo Grotius. Different states were engaging in some relations with each other, diplomatic relations, consular relations, other forms of relations. Also the universality, in my opinion, is not a new phenomenon. If you look at the teachings of Buddha, in my opinion, the first rebel of his generation, 2,600 years ago, he rebelled. He was the Nepalese crown prince. He gave up the palace. He gave up the throne, went to India, meditated, and achieved enlightenment. His teachings were non-violence, egalitarian. The first egalitarian of prominence of Asian origin was Buddha, 2,600 years ago, preaching universalism, even that time, preaching egalitarianism. That message was carried on by Gandhi when he led the independence of India. The views of Buddha and Gandhi were inspired by a Hindu religious scripture known as Gita. Anybody who has time to read it, if you read the entirety of it, you will say, this is the first instrument preaching universalism. That's how I say, when people talk about universalism is an imposition <coughs> of the Western world, I have difficulty in agreeing with it. For instance, I myself, as a young Nepali boy, grew up in Nepal, looking out the window, looking at the majestic view of the Himalayas, changing their color with the rise of the sun. The mountains of Nepal will get the first kiss of the sun. And then I look at the south, my right, India. You may have seen in London, incredible India. It is hugely diverse country of nearly 1.3 billion population. In the Nepali, you look to the north, to your left, China, another country with 1.4 billion population. Not as diverse as India, but diverse in terms of ethnic composition, culture, so on and so forth. So those who wanted to think of the system of governance in that part of the world had to think of universalism, egalitarianism, unity in diversity. So these are the values we are trying to promote. You are right to say, mention the word nirvana. Comes from Buddha. Yoga is a Hindu word. It has become fashionable, hijacked by people. It's called yoga these days. They have added I at the end. So these are all the values that promote universalism. Therefore, what we are trying to do today at this conference, through the conferences of this nature, trying to promote universalism, the project of international law, in my opinion, is a project of international law which remains incomplete, both in its content and application. Remains is a project of international law, system of good governance internationally, not only in national context, but in international context, so we are trying to make a contribution to make the project a successful one. As I said before, we are talking to each other. The discourse of international is going global for sure. Until recently, there were many, not many societies of international law in Asia and Africa or Latin America. I had the privilege of working together with a small group of colleagues to establish the Asian Society of International Law in 2007. And launching is a flagship publication, the Asian Journal of International Law. I was a founding executive editor. After five years, I became chairman of the board of editors. And the conferences that we organize, the idea behind it is to nurture and cultivate universalism. Promote dialogue 
between different cultures, societies and civilizations. Half of the humanity lives in Asia. Half of the world population resides in Asia. So unless we understand the Asian perspectives, if there is any, our understanding of universalism will remain incomplete. The same applies to Africa. Therefore, audience of this nature, I can see in different Asian countries. If you have attended any of the conferences of the Asian society, as big as this one, young, enthusiastic, budding scholars of new generation coming and participate in the deliberation on how to make this project of international law a success. Basically, universalism, global international governance. Therefore, I can see universalism in the making. The dialogue and debate people are having in Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas is the same. The objective is the same. The approaches could be different. Different perspectives could be there. But we all are aiming towards achieving universalism of values and principles through our own different institutions and tools, and of course, with our publications. With these words of brief introduction, I'm aware of the fact that our uh, session here is between uh, uh, before uh, uh, our dinner in a place no other than Old Trafford. One of the incentives of me for coming to this conference was to attend the dinner <laughs> in Old Trafford. I had been longing to visit that place for a long time, never had the opportunity. Joe and Ian kindly organized that one. Therefore, we don't have much time, but we do have about 10, 15 minutes for any questions that you may have to our distinguished speaker, Professor Clavers. Please, as usual, identify yourself, who you are, and please be brief, as brief as you can. I would like you to ask questions rather than long comments, so that as many people as possible can have the floor. Therefore, I would now like to open the floor for discussion, and I would like to see your hands. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. You have the floor. Hey, yes. Felix Lange, uh, Humboldt University. Uh, if uh, com competition should be our ethos, what should be our ethos as academics? academics? Thank you. So I would like to take a couple of more questions, perhaps three at a time, <laughs> then give you the opportunity. Please, the lady here. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Anne van Aken, University of Hamburg. Um, Jan, I always very much enjoy um, your talks, um, but I have a slight disagreement, and that comes back to the competition question. Don't you think that at least the, the necessity to apply for, for, for third funding um, actually makes people co collaborate? If you look at ERC grants, it's always diverse universities. There have to be more than one principal investigator. I think actually it fosters collaboration, which was largely absent, especially in law schools, not in other disciplines. But I think my feeling is Europeans have been very bad in, in collaborating um, or co-authoring. Um, and the second thing I would like to, I just didn't understand it. Um, if you jump over the fence where it's low, you will not get into a good journal because anybody could have written it. So the research, at least where I, and I guess everybody here, you know you have better papers and worse papers. My better papers took me a long, long while. A long, long while. So I, I don't see this sort of incentive argument here. On the contrary, I think it's really that people start having longer term projects. Thank you. I would like to do the third one. Yeah. You have the Thank you, Yuval Shani Hebrew. You. Uh, so let, let me try to challenge you a little bit on the on the issue. I mean, you, you mentioned that there are three schools that uh, that are basically not speaking with one another, right? Uh, the doctrinal, I think it was the critical, and the Russian. Um, is it not going to be uh, 
much more serious in, in, in the foreseeable future because if you look at um, how young PhD students are being trained, they're increasingly being trained in disciplines other than the law or are expected to undergo training uh, in economics or in history or in philosophy. And, and, and I think we are witnessing a gradual shift from uh, people who are uh, uh, um, legal academics uh, to people who are academics who are whose object of study is the law, and then the question is, what is then the common denominator for all these lawyers? And certainly, what is the common denominator for all these international lawyers? I mean, people who do history, maybe they have much more in common with historians than they have with uh, international lawyers. So do, are we, in a way, losing this common thread that enabled the older generation to find a common language? Thank you. Now, you have the for Professor Klavos. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yep. I just shouldn't touch it. Okay. Um, insightful questions, all of them. To start with Yuval's question, am I not uh, too optimistic, really? That's what you're asking, right? Um, isn't it getting only worse, this division between lawyers and, and academics who study the law? In my bleaker moments, I might agree with you, yeah. And I don't have any non-bleak opinion on that. I think law is, of course, a curious discipline in the sense that you can study it both internally and externally. I think those terms go back to, to Hart already and then probably a lot before him. There's an internal aspect to the law for which you have to have a sense which you probably usually get with legal training. That's at least the underlying philosophy and which you do not get if you're a historian and you start looking at legal artifacts, or if you're a philosopher and you start looking at the law, or if you're an economist and you start looking at the law. Um, that gap may become bigger and bigger. I'm, I'm not sure that I would disagree with you on that. Um, and that will mean that we're losing contact with practitioners, that the academics and the practitioners become even more divided than they already are. And I'm not certain that is a very good development. Also, with a view to creating the next generation of teachers, because you run the risk if you specialize as an economics-oriented scholar or an anthropologist studying law or something, that you can do that brilliantly, but that you are not capable of explaining to first-year students what the difference between jurisdiction and admissibility is. And that's a pretty vital distinction for everyone who wants to be trained as a lawyer. And I guess most people enter law school with that ambition still, rather than become mini academics. And some of us are fortunate enough to uh, have managed that, but I guess most people's ambition is to end up working for a law firm, become a practicing lawyer, and then it is useful if your teacher can tell you what the distinction between jurisdiction and admissibility is. So I, I guess I'm with you on that one. Uh, Anna, the jumping across the fence where the fence is the lowest. What I have in mind is not so much that articles would not take time, but that the topics we choose tend to be the ones um, where the materials are relatively easy to find. Michael Reisman, whom I've mentioned in a different connection, in the 80s made the point that international lawyers are a bit like the guy in the dark alley who has lost his car keys. He's going to look for them under the nearest street light because that's the only place he can see, regardless of whether he lost his keys 200 meters down the road. And the point of that is that we tend to look at stuff where there are court decisions readily available, for instance where there are easily identifiable regulatory activities in the form of standard setting or treaty making or that, that sort of thing. And this is what my example of studies of the World Bank versus the International Organization for Migration, for instance, was referring to. The IOM is far less accessible and thus you call me cynical, but I think there is a relationship there because it is so far so much less accessible, we don't look at it. There's no literature on the IOM. You can look at the handbooks on international organizations, you won't see much. You can look at the handbooks on migration law, you won't see much. It's just a handful of articles here and there in a couple of journals. 
And that means that anyone who wants to do research, I, sp I speak from frustration. I've just finished a piece on the IOM and it took me a hell of a lot of effort to even get a superficial knowledge of what it does. Um, so there is that kind of problem, I think. It's not so much that we take easy topics, per se, or do it like with the left hand, as the saying goes, but that we tend to go for things where there is some traction in doing stuff. Does that make any sense? You look very uh, unconvinced. But we can continue that uh, discussion uh, in another way. Whether funding fosters cooperation or whether it fosters competition, I tend to think that the cooperation fostered by funding opportunities is, is fairly minimal, in our field at least. Um, like the ERC has only recently reintroduced its synergy grants. Beyond that, it's a matter of the individual uh, PI, that's not private eye, that's principal investigator, who is supposed to be a star and then can bring a team along of, of junior people typically. And collaborative efforts are not discouraged per se, but also not encouraged. And you see the same with national funding schemes. There are some funding schemes for the collaboration. Uh, and I'm a bit skeptical about how that works in practice. Because if we end up collaborating with social scientists, it usually means that we end up doing mediocre social science according to social science methodologies that we can't control, that we don't command, that we're not trained in, rather than them taking the law very seriously. So there's an element there of what you might call colonial appropriation of disciplines that I think we should at least be aware of. Now, the $64,000 question, of course, came from up there. What should our professional ethos be if not efficiency and competition? And I take those now in one single breath. Call me old-fashioned, but how about truth and stuff? Uh, yeah, I know uh, there are French philosophers who say there is no truth and things. And I even agree with that, but that's not a good enough reason to give that up completely and say, oh, well, then I'll just sit in my chair and I'll describe what grows in my garden and I put that in a journal and everyone happy, happy ever after. There has to be something a bit more than that, I guess. Thank you very much, Nir. Now, we can have another brief round of uh, questions, second round, uh, because I'm under clear instructions from John to finish it. Uh, in time for us to go to Old Trafford. So I can have another round. Three questions, a very brief one, please. The lady over here. Thank you. So I guess very briefly, I'm trying to locate the golden age that you seem to be presuming somewhere in the past uh, where there was conversation, where there was not no competition. And I wonder, or at least less competition, or that wasn't the driving force. But I, I do wonder to what extent that golden age requires a much less diverse um, or you know, more closed academy than the one that we have now. So there is, I mean, I, I, I don't think these, two, uh, these things are, you know, I mean, I agree with some of what you say. I just wonder whether you've yourself gone into high drama um, to, <laughs> to sort of exaggerate a situation yeah. that maybe isn't that different mm -hmm. and that the, the, you know, the authoritative voices of the past, I mean, the hierarchy of the past was so clear that there was no disputing, there was no competition because once you've got it, it was the, it was mm -hmm. the aristocracy and that was it. I mean, you could have obviously all sorts of things going on, but, but really it was pretty close system. Thank you. Any other hands? Yes, I can see one over there and there one. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew Lang. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, let me just speak without a microphone. So, um, can you all hear him? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. So thank you very much. I'm sure we all recognize the picture of the profession um, that you paint. But also let me just make two comments, I guess, by way of of challenge. The first is that I think um, I think the aspiration towards a sort of anti-dogmatism is much more common than we think. 
I mean, when we talk to a lot of our colleagues, I think the aspiration to be able to be fluent in all of these different communities is much more common, I think, than we think. I'm thinking, for example, of, of Professor Weiler's talk in your position some easel conferences ago, where he talked about the international lawyer as the all-terrain vehicle. And I think this aspiration towards a sort of anti-dogmatic fluency amongst communities is, is actually is, is at least as common as the dogmatic exclusionary um, position, if not much more so. And so the question, one of the interesting questions for me then is how that aspiration, that ethic, becomes channeled into particular forms of cooperation and dialogue which may not have the structural effects or true dialogue that you're talking about, which still leaves us with a kind of a fragmented profession. I'm not sure that the absence of that aspiration is necessarily universal. And the second similar point I wanted to make, I guess, is that um, you painted a picture of three different schools, and of course there are many different schools, but we've all had that experience of, the, of, of when one enters into a different school and so on, one finds a lot more internal diversity and incoherence than one expected from the outside. That's a, that's a banality and a commonplace. But I guess the question is, how do our accounts of the profession as being, uh, as a matter of pure fact, uh, um, starting from a position of groups which don't talk to one another, how do those accounts themselves perpetuate that in some way? You know? Thank you. Now, you have the last word, the gentleman over there. Oh, sorry, yeah, thank you. So um, I took your uh, lecture as a, I'm Tim Sellers from Baltimore. I took your lecture as a criticism of the parochialism among schools of academic thought. Uh, how can any of us understand what the world is if we don't listen to one another? And yet, at the same time, the schools of thought you mentioned disagree for a reason. At a very basic level, they disagree not only about what the law is, but also how to discover or clarify what the law is. And that's an issue about which I think uh, we ought to be fighting. It's an issue about which we ought to fight each other. In fact, I think what was wrong with the old lawyers, uh, if I may, now that I am an old lawyer, uh, is that they did not properly discuss these fundamental questions. So it's good that at last in our field we're finally addressing them because the older doctrine was often empty because it was so largely unexamined. Thank you. I'm afraid, yeah, maybe the last word, the lady here. Yeah. Thank you. Very brief, please. Court of Human Rights. I have a quite challenging question. Maybe I will took it my professorship background at uh, the background of the judge. How the picture of the critical school of the discipline changed in the last, you know, 20 years, 16 years that I was in the discipline. I think, you know, of course, how this, this critics and the painting of the discipline done by the critical school that, for my mind, you reflected, have changed. Because for me, it's the same, there are the same scenarios, there are the same critics, there are the same painting that was done maybe 20 years ago. This is my first question. The, the, second, uh, the second question is that, I, it's more common than a uh, question. I, I think that, for instance, the branch of history of international law that, uh, that involve people that are going to archives and so on and so forth developed very much in the starting with the, tw the last 20, 20 years ago to, to, let, to try to have this span of time. And this is one, one, one observation. The second observation is that we see more and more contrary that you, what you are saying, that practitioner and academics are together. And it's very rare now to see somebody who is a pure academic and was never in the practice and vice versa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid that's the last question. Now, Professor Klavers, you have the floor, and I would be grateful if you would be very brief. <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to be very brief, because then I can escape from answering some of the questions, perhaps, properly. Um, the golden age, that's a wonderful term, and you accuse me of, of uh, resorting to high drama, which is clever, if nothing else. I, I did not call it the golden age. I was trying to sketch 
an age, whether it's golden or not, is a different ball game. Uh, I think it was a different age, at least, but maybe we should leave it at that. I would agree with you that that was a very closed academy, that there were all sorts of hierarchies at play. I'm not sure there are less hierarchies at play right now. That may be that we've replaced some of the old ones by new ones, but that's a topic for over a beer, perhaps. Uh, Andrew's questions, as ever, um, force me to engage in an act of self-reflection, and I'm sure that's a term you'll recognize, um, for which I simply don't have the time right now. Um, whether anti-dogmatism is more common than we think, I can certainly hope so, but looking around me, not here per se, but generally, uh, I'm not so certain. If I see what some journals publish and what they reject, then I think there is some of that dogma at play. Um, schools will also be, of course, if you change the prism, if you change the, 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 the settings of the microscope, what looks like a coherent school from one perspective will look far more diverse from another perspective. That's. Uh, I guess that's par for the course, yeah. So I'm not in disagreement with you, but the proper answer deserves more reflection than I can now give you. Uh, Tim, I'm not sure I understood your question. Um, if you were saying that schools differ about how to find the law, my guess is that some of them are not all that interested actually in what the law says, but rather in what its effects are. Now, you and I might agree that in order to make that assessment, you have to first know what the law says, because otherwise you can't say what its effects are. But I sometimes, and I won't mention any names, I'm well-bred in that respect, but sometimes you get the sense that people skip that first step, that, oops, that the idea of talking about the effects of the law are considered more interesting than first trying to figure out what the law actually says. So I'm not sure how to deal with your question. And as for George Muttock, I guess we'll just have to disagree. <laughs> it's uh, about the interactions between practice and academia. I, I, I'm worried seriously that, and the, the word worry is chosen advisedly, that there are wider gulfs than before and that may not be such a good thing for a discipline which in its educational part at least thrives on that connection to practice. And that's where the law is such a strange discipline, perhaps. And that's where we differ from political scientists who don't have a practice that political scientists are to be trained for, uh, or other social scientists. There are, of course, people who end up in politics, but that's a different ballgame. Yeah, but that's... A, yeah. I guess we have to agree to disagree on this. Thank you. Thank you so much.